Imagine a block on a frictionless surface being pulled by a force in one direction. According to Newton's laws, the block accelerates in that direction. But what happens if we apply an equal force in the opposite direction? The forces cancel out and the block stays still. In this case, the block is in equilibrium. Notice that the two forces are dividing a circle into two equal parts, forming an angle of 2 pi over 2, which is pi radians, or 180 in degrees. Now, let's take it a step further. What if we have three forces? How can we achieve equilibrium with these three forces acting on the block? To do this, we arrange each force so that these forces divide the circle into three equal parts, meaning each force makes an angle of 2 pi over 3 radians with each other. Next, let's consider the case with four forces. If the forces are evenly spaced, each force will make an angle of pi over 2 radians with the next. Each force has an opposite counterpart which cancels out the other. So, just like in the previous case, the system is in equilibrium. This idea works for any number of forces, whether it's 5, 6, or 7 forces, as long as they are evenly spaced around a circle and greater than 1. If there is only one force, there is no balancing force to cancel it out, and equilibrium cannot be achieved. Here's the problem that I want to address in this video. Picture this. You have n vectors greater than 1, all of same magnitude spreading out from a central point and evenly spaced around a circle. Each one makes an angle of 2 pi over n radians with the next. The big question is, what is the resulting sum of all these vectors? So far we know these vectors perfectly cancel each other out resulting in a sum of 0. But why these forces cancel out? Many textbooks' explanation simply says it's symmetry. But just saying symmetry doesn't really give us a full explanation of why the sum is zero. One way to get a better grasp of this is by picturing the vectors being shifted without changing their angles, so that the tail of one connects to the head of another. They form a closed polygon, which is why the resulting sum is zero. It's a cool way to visualize the concept. But Mathematicians are not quite convinced with this type of visual explanations. The goal of this video is to provide the mathematical proof behind this phenomena. There is a beautiful and elegant proof offered by the beautiful theorem or a formula that you might not encounter in typical textbooks. It might seem surprising that such an abstract concept like Euler's formula can prove something so practical in physics, but Trust me, this video is going to be exciting. We're about to explore one of the most beautiful connections between math and physics. I'll start with how I first encountered this problem in my high school physics class. Picture a ring with a uniform positive charge. What is the electric field intensity at its center? Think of this ring as being made up of many infinitesimal charge elements ticket. Each element creates a small electric field DE, which is directed radially outward the line connecting TQ and the center of the ring. According to Coulomb's law, the magnitude of this electric field is given by Ke times the magnitude of the charge element TQ over R squared, where Ke is the Coulomb's constant and r is the distance from the charge to the point where field is being calculated, in this case the center of the ring. The magnitude of the electric field depends upon the amount of charge dq and the distance r from the charge. Since we are considering a uniformly charged ring, each element dq has the same charge because the charge is evenly distributed along the entire ring. Additionally, because all these elements are equidistant from the center, being part of a circle, the electric fields they produce are of equal magnitude. The vector sum of all these electric fields turns out to be zero. In other words, the net electric field at the center of this uniformly charged ring is zero. When I asked my teacher why this happens, he simply said it's symmetry. Each charge element dq on the ring has an equal dq located directly opposite, cancelling each other out. 
This symmetry explanation works well for continuous child distribution, but what if we are dealing with a discrete number of stars around a circle? With an even number of charges, it's easy to see that each electric field has an exact opposite to cancel it out. But what if there is an odd number of charges? There is no exact opposite field to cancel out each one. So does this balancing act still hold for any number of vectors? Let's start by considering these vectors at the origin of an xy plane. To keep things simple, we will assume that each vector has a magnitude of 1. Uh, let's assign numbers to these vectors from 0 to n-1. We'll assume that k represents the index of each vector, ranging from 0 to n-1. For each vector k, we can describe its component using unit vectors along the x-axis and y-axis. Here, the angle theta k can be expressed as a function of vector index k. Since each vector is evenly spaced around circle, the angle between consecutive vectors is 2 pi over n. The zero vector aligns with the x-axis, making an angle of zero radians. The first vector makes an angle of 2 pi over n. Second, 2 times 2 pi over n. Third, 2 times 3 pi over n. Following this pattern, the k vector makes an angle of 2k pi over n with the x-axis. Now, let's substitute this expression for the theta k into our vector expression. We get vector vk equals cos 2k pi over n i cap plus sin 2k pi over n j cap. Now, to find the total vector sum, we add up all vectors from k equals 0 to n minus 1. Now, we can break down this expression into x and y components. Thus, the sum of all vectors is the sum of the x components plus the sum of the y components. Now, to prove that the vector sum is zero, we need to show that the sum of both the x and y components to be zero simultaneously. That is, we need to prove the sum of cos 2k pi over n equals zero and the sum of sin 2k pi over n equals zero from k equals zero to n minus one. This is a crucial sub problem within the prodal problem we are addressing. But how do we prove that these sums are zero at the same time? In a typical math class, you might encounter this kind of problem to solve. If we just look at it, it may seem abstract and one might ask why this is useful. What I love about physics is it shows you where the problem is actually coming from. In this case, solving this can be really useful, especially when it comes to understanding the sum of vectors. While there might be some trigonometric methods to prove this, they would likely be complex and tedious. This is where Euler's formula comes in. It simplifies the process and provides a beautiful proof, which is the key point I want to focus in my video today. If you click on this video, you probably already have a basic understanding of Euler's formula. I won't dive deep into the details since I have covered it in my earlier videos. For now, let me give you a quick overview. Picture a point in a complex screen that is unit distance away from the origin, making an angle of theta with the x-axis. It represents a complex number with real part cos theta and imaginary part sin theta. According to Euler's formula, this complex number can also be written in exponential form e to the i theta. In this context, we are going to shift these vectors into complex plane. Here, each vector can be represented as a complex number, where the x component cos 2k pi over n corresponds to the real part, and the y component sin 2k pi over n corresponds to the imaginary part. Thanks to Euler's formula, these vectors can also be written in exponential form, e to the i 2k pi over n. So the sum of all these vectors is the sum of e to the i 2k pi over n from k equals 0 to n minus 1. If we can somehow prove that the sum of these exponents is 0, then both its real and imaginary parts also must be 0. This would imply that the sum of cos 2k pi over n equals 0 and the sum of sin 2k pi over n equals 0 from k equals to 0 to n minus 1. Alright, let's jump right into our final proof. Let's take 
another look at this exponential expression of the vector sum. When we expand the summation, it looks like this. 1 plus e to the i 2 pi over n plus e to the i 4 pi over n and so on up to e to the i 2 n minus 1 pi over n. Notice that e to the i 2 pi over n is common in all terms. So let's make things simpler by setting e to the i 2 pi over n equals x. Now our series looks like this 1 plus x plus x squared and so on. This will look familiar. It's a geometric series. We can use a specific formula given by 1 minus x to the n over 1 minus x. Since we have x equals e to the i 2 pi over n, replacing x in the formula, we get 1 minus e to the i 2 pi over n times n over 1 minus e to the i 2 pi over n. Here, the two n terms in the exponent cancel out, leaving us with 1 minus e to the i 2 pi. Now, from Euler's formula, we know e to the i 2 pi equals cos 2 pi plus i sine 2 pi, which simplifies to 1. So the sum becomes 1 minus 1 over 1 minus e to the i 2 pi over n. Therefore, the total sum is 0. Remember, we initially considered unit vectors. However, this result holds true for the vectors of any magnitude. Suppose the vectors have a magnitude of r. Geometrically, it means all these unit vectors are scaled by a factor of r. When you look at the Euler's expression for these vectors, this is what it looks like. Sum of r times e to the i to k pi over n. Since r is constant, we can pull it out of the summation. We already proved that what this summation is, 0, right? So, r times 0 is 0. And that wraps up our proof that the sum of vectors is zero using Euler's formula and the properties of geometric series. The beauty of this problem is that it isn't limited to just a finite number of vectors. We can use the same principle to prove that the sum is zero even for continuous force distribution, just like the charge ring example we saw earlier. Now, when we move from a discrete set of vectors to continuous distribution, the summation can be transferred into an integral as n tends to infinity. n over 2 pi integration from 0 to 2 pi e to the i theta d theta. To evaluate the integral, we use the antiderivative of e to the i theta, which is e to the i theta over i. Now we can substitute the limits from 0 to 2 pi. At 2 pi, e to the i 2 pi is 1 and at theta equals 0, e to the i0 is also 1. Hence, the integral of e to the i theta from 0 to 2 pi simplifies to 1 minus 1 over i, which is 0. This proved that the sum of vectors is 0 even in continuous distributions, just like in the discrete case. For our programming friends, we might not prefer this detailed proof or for anyone looking to verify the result computationally, Here's a Python code snippet you can use to confirm the outcome. The code calculates the sum of n unit vectors evenly spatial around the circle. By setting n equals 12, you should see the result is nearly 0, confirming that the vectors balance out as expected. You can change n to any positive integer greater than 1 to explore the effect of different number of vectors. The cool thing about this concept is how simple it seems at first, yet the solution has so much depth. What starts off as a basic vector addition puzzle turns into an exciting dive into complex numbers and geometric series. This really shows how abstract math concept can give us such clear and elegant solution to real world problems. Thanks for watching and until next time, keep exploring the amazing world of maths.